as I said, I've had the joy of working with Margaret Shannon for almost a year. Uh, she came to me because she wanted to self-publish. And I've got to say that at that point in time, when she came in, this was the most complicated um, and extensive book I had ever worked on. I mean, amazing amount of formatting that went involved with her particular book because of the sheer amount of information she has gotten on her family going back to the 12th century. And, and wow, our photographs. And what I love about it, and she's gonna talk about it and how she does it, but the thing that I really enjoy, because otherwise it could be a real dry sort of a thing, is the stories, not just about her family, because there's those two, but what's going on in the world at that time, how people lived in England in the 1200s, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, how they had to handle the things that we take for granted now. And then coming into the United States and how that changed everything. All those little stories she threw in there and, and information of the history of the era. So that's one of the things that I love about her books. Um, she's got credentials out the yin yang, but you know, <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and let her do all that and you know, she's a genealogical historian. She has all kinds of, of I don't really have her them memorized, but I, I saw them at one point. <laughs> so I was like, oh, okay, yeah, she knows exactly how to do this. And hey, would you be a good person to come and talk to us? So Margaret, take it away. All right, thank you. Well, let me see. Now I'm supposed to click one participant can share at a time. Yes. Okay. Um, it, it's, let me see, it's not doing what I had before. Now, let me see, I'm sorry, we, we should have started this again. So can you all see that? No, go to okay. the bottom where you have the share screen, the big green share screen, click on okay. that and then click on, on, the, on the one that shows your PowerPoint filling the screen. Okay, I'm sorry, we should have practiced it. Big green share screen, there it is. And, Hello. okay, I'm getting there. Uh, yep, from, over okay. online, from beginning and go. From beginning, start from the beginning. There we are, okay, yay. So this is me, Margaret Abby Ashman Kruger. Shannon. So I, um, these are my given names. For 23 years, I carried that name of, of Kruger. And though today I'm grateful not to carry it any longer, it is the surname of my three adult sons and these five beautiful grandchildren. And so I have to be grateful for the name and the gifts of that marriage. Now, when someone, and you all have been calling me Margaret, when someone calls out Margaret, um, it, it gives me a moment of pause because I think I'm going to be asked to sign a legal document or get ushered into a doctor's office because all my life I have been gone I have gone by the nickname Molly. So one of the things that we're going to talk about in the first class is what is your full legal name? Do you know the origins of your surname or your given name? Do you know why your parents chose your name? Were you named for someone in the family or a famous person? Or as an adult, have you chosen a name for yourself? And what is it and why did you choose it? And do you have a nickname? So I looked up nicknames for Margaret and I found things like Marge and Madge and Midge and May and M, Emmy, Mags, Meg, Peg, Peggy, and then there's Rita, a shortened nickname for the name Margarita, which is the Latin for Margaret. My grandfather's sister and her daughter were both Margarita and the sister was nicknamed Rita. One website lists Molly as a very creative 
nickname for Margaret, along with Muggs, Muggy, Gigi, Greta, and Gretel. I think I kind of like Molly. But how did my parents come up with it? Well, a few months back, I, um, I have a cousin who lives in Corrales, and she called and she said, Molly, I have these letters that were written by your grandfather and my grandmother, Margarita Rita, when they were children in a boarding school in England. And I'd like to like you to have them. Well, they were folded and they had been folded for years and they were in a Ziploc bag. And there's probably about 40 of them. And so I, I got them and I opened them up very carefully, did steamed them, put weights on them to get them flat. And I took them to a, a woman who uh, does photography management. She scanned them for me. And um, they, uh, I just think they're adorable. And so my uh, he Harry or Henry Abbey, Jr. was my grandfather and Margarita Rita was his sister and they're aged eight and 10. And they are writing these letters to their grandmother, Amelia Matilda Johnstone Abbey and their aunts, Katie, Julia and Amelia Margaret who has gone, who goes by the name Molly. And I'll show you that in just a minute. But aren't these these are just treasures that, um, it, it, you know, and they write stories about their outings and the, the weather and planting a garden. And one of them had seeds in the, in the fold and draw these adorable little pictures. So they are now preserved in archival envelopes, which is, which is good. So here's the letter from North End House in it still exists in Ditchling, Hassex, England. And um, here it is. Um, all the Miss Dumbrils send their love to you and aunties Katie and Molly. I was 67 years old. And that's the first solid evidence I have that my parents nicknamed me Molly after uh, a great aunt Amelia Margaret. So that was, that was, that was fun. So where do you want to begin writing? Oh, here she is. Isn't she pretty? Yeah, that's Amelia Margaret, nicknamed Molly. So where do you want to begin writing your family history? We'll start with your name and, and look at, at that. And would you want to start with you and then your parents and your grandparents going back in time? Or do you have an immigrant ancestor or somebody that uh, the, the family knows stories about and then write about that person and come forward in time? Would you wanna write about your maternal ancestors, your mother's side of the family or your paternal ancestors? or like I did, both, or something else. Maybe there's a particular character that you'd like to, a family member that you'd like to do more of a, of a character study on one person. One place to start is by looking at photos, photo albums, family Bibles, family stories, letters, Maybe there are some older living relatives that um, either you or someone else has, has taken notes or recordings from them. Maybe you have that pesky relative who, that's me in our family, that loves genealogy and is very willing to, to do all the Google searches and go to the genealogy websites and libraries and walk through cemeteries and and, you know, not dig up dead people, but talk to these, find the dead people and, and, and talk to them and see what their, what their stories are. 
you can you can simply begin with what you have. You you definitely, as Rose said, you definitely don't have to make it as complicated as I did, but you can do um, a thorough job um, by just focusing on on one branch of the family or a small um, number of people. And then if you get the bug, you can expand. Um, my decision on how to write this family history kind of came about in a roundabout way. This woman is um, my father's mother, Lucinda Holland Ashman. She was born in Ireland, north of Ireland. And she came to the US in 1890 at age 16. She came across the Atlantic on a um, steamer um, ship. And when she got to New York, she entered through Castle Garden, which was the precursor to Ellis Island. And by that time, the um, Transcontinental Railway was um, functioning and she made the trek all the way across America to um, San Francisco to, um, to, to be um, most likely an indentured servant. There was a family in San Francisco that paid her passage and she came to work for them to, to pay, pay that back. Um, I have I have looked at this picture for years. I, I only met her a couple of times and all before I was five years old, but I come back to her time and time again. And um, I just have always wanted to know something more about her. I moved to New Mexico. Let me see my next slide. Yes, I moved to New Mexico in the year 2000 couple of years after the divorce with an empty nest. And I found that I had time to finally um, explore Grammy Ashman's story. The secretary at work was a genealogy buff and she connected me with various people. And I signed up for a 30 day subscription to ancestry.com. Believe me when I tell you that it has come a long, long way in the last 22 years. Um, I found a few connections through Ancestry and I decided with some of my newfound freedom that I would take a trip to Ireland. And so I went and I rented a car and I drove myself around and I went to um, Armagh and found more information about my grandmother and I also found a lot of information that I, I didn't quite know what to do with. Found possible siblings and possible her, her parents. And um, so I, had, I filed all that away. And when I came home, it seemed that um, life got busy and I less, let that short-term ancestry uh, subscription go. And I met this man up here in the snow and um, we, um, we started dating and um, I married him in 2003 and his name is Richard Shannon. And so I took his surname because I figured um, coming from an Irish grandmother that Molly Shannon had a really nice ring to it. So um, in 2000, I'm going to skip around, but fast forward a little bit. In 2014, we, here's, um, here's Armagh in the north of Ireland is where she was from. So in 2014, um, Richard had work in the Phoenix area. And in Phoenix, there is an Irish cultural center, which is this building and the McClellan Irish Library. And they have resources abundant for all things um, Irish, all sorts of records and um, databases. And um, so I found a lot more information on my Irish grandmother through them. Also, while I was in 
um, Arizona, I took several creative writing courses and I decided that what I wanted to do was to write a novel about my Irish grandmother, but sort of it would have to be sort of creative nonfiction because I just didn't really know enough about her life. I returned to Albuquerque in 2015 and found, discovered NaNoWriMo. And for any of you that don't know, NaNoWriMo is National Novel Writing Month. It takes place in November. And it's, well, it's kind of fun. They have contests, you are assigned to teams. They have, well, they had, I don't know how they're doing it now, but they had local events where they would have write-ins at libraries or Starbucks. And um, you would be challenged to speed write or to write so many words during a day. And one of the things I did um, was I, um, oops, whoops, whoops, I, had bought this book, First Draft in 30 Days. And so I used that book and, my, and the 30 days of NaNoWriMo and I outlined 32 chapters of Lucinda's life story with all the embellishments I wanted to add, changing her name, holding on loosely to the facts I knew and uh, embellishing with the story that I thought would be interesting, the story I wanted to tell. And then I began to flesh out that story. I took classes from UNM Continuing Ed, from Rob Spiegel, Sarah Baker. Um, I, and I got to the point in the novel where Lucinda had sailed the Atlantic and traveled on the Transcontinental Railroad from New York to San Francisco. One of the resources I found during that time was um, a woman who had actually made that journey in the late 1800s on the Transcontinental Railroad, kept a journal and, and it was published. And so even though it's not my grandmother's story, I have day by day journal entries of this woman's um, trip across America and the, and the scenery and the people and you know what a treasure to um, inform the story I was going to tell. So I got to the point where she's in San Francisco and she's going to meet my grandfather whose name is William Turner Ashman. He was born in San Francisco, um, died young in Oakland, California and sometime about 10 years after she arrived in America, um, they get married. And I thought, well, you know, who was he? All I knew about him was this photograph and that my mother told me that he had died young, 59, I think, of a heart attack. And my own father had died at 59 of a heart attack. And that's, that's really all I knew. So I thought, okay, let me go back to Ancestry. Well, by now, Ancestry has so many more records. And I, um, I did find out that, yes, he died, he died young. He died at that age, but he died of colon cancer. And he was one of five siblings Never in all my years growing up did either of my parents mention that my dad had all these aunts and uncles. I never heard anything about his family. So I decided to dig in and find out more about these five siblings and who were their parents. Through Ancestry, I found that there were other people that had him in their family tree and you can do um, conversations through ancestry that are kind of anonymous they're built into ancestry so um, unless you gave people your personal email they wouldn't be able to find you except for, so it felt 
like a safe place to do that. And just this whole world opened up and I have five or six cousins now in California that we have exchanged all sorts of information. We, I've met a couple of them and um, I finally knew something more about um, William Turner Ashman. Um, e, sometime after 2015, I went to um, San Francisco, Oakland for a, um, a writing conference. And I walked miles and miles to find the, the places they had lived. I went to libraries, I went to museums, I went to Colma, California. Is anyone familiar with Colma, California, outside of San Francisco? Colma, California has more dead people than living people. It is, Coma, California is all cemeteries, except for the people that, you know, a few people that live and work for the cemetery. It's, it's just this whole area of, of cemeteries. And so I found all their, all their graves and headstones and, and all kinds of interesting things. And I found um, this picture of Richard Turner Ashman, who is William's father, and my great grandfather. It's he's quite the character. Um, he was born in Brooklyn and then died in San Francisco. One of the things, and I, I don't have a pointer, but you can see that his hairline is fairly straight across. My my ex husband and and mine, I, we have a little bit of a widow's peak. My oldest son, that is his hairline. I just, I saw that picture and I went, oh, that's where Will got his, where Will got his hairline. He doesn't have, he has waves, but not quite that much. Um, so I, um, I went to look a little bit more about who this, who he was. And I went to the, um, where am I thing? Went to the downtown San Francisco library. And I had found his, um, his name and this picture, there he is. Uh, the hair has been styled a little bit more for that day. And it, the book is called Men of Rope. It's the history of the um, Tubbs Cordage Company of San Francisco. Rope making was the first manufacturing business in San Francisco. And um, most of it was made for um, maritime for the shipping industry, but they made just enough for hangings <laughs> because it was a pretty lawless uh, time out in California. The, um, they, they manufactured this rope in um, places called rope walks. And so they had buildings that were a mile long because they stretched the rope way out. So if you see old maps of um, San Francisco, there will be buildings that go for a mile or more. And that's where they, that's where they stretched the rope. All right. So um, when I was in this uh, library finding this picture, and it was one of those places where you use white gloves and everything, they had um, artifacts around the room. And the one bit of information that I have on Richard Turner is that he left Brooklyn, New York in 1851 on a ship called the Golden Gate. And say it was on sail and steam and it went around the Cape of South America up to San Francisco. And Again, like the Transcontinental Railroad, I found a man's diary recording his trip. And so it has great stories about activities on shipboard, foods they ate, going from the Northern to the Southern Hemisphere and the, um, the, the different stars about being becalmed somewhere around the, 
the point of the cape. Um, so it's just fascinating to think, here's my great grandfather and that was the journey he took. So in this library and the archives was the ship's bell from the Golden Gate. It had made several more journeys from Brooklyn to San Francisco. And on one of them, probably in the 1860s, it, it caught on fire. And there were big newspaper stories of the rescue and all of that. And the ship's bell was there in that, in that little museum. Um, so let's see. So what I do, I have him, uh, like I said, in 1851, but I know nothing about his ancestry. I know his mother's name is Lillian Turner. His father's name would have been Ashman, but I have nothing. Now, by this time, um, I have had, um, and that's what we call in genealogy, a brick wall, where you just, everything you try and you can't find it. Now, there are people that are masters at breaking through these brick walls. And one tool that's very useful today is DNA testing. And so I did have my DNA tested through Ancestry and I matched with some people, um, about a third cousin, which is pretty good. And they have a William Turner Ashman in their family tree that lives in Brooklyn. Now the dates were wrong and the place was wrong to be my grandfather in California, but most likely it is Richard Turner's, my great grandfather's brother. But when I talked to these people, chatted with them, they were like, oh yeah, he's in our tree, but we're really not interested in that part of the family. And, and that, that was the end of the conversation. And I thought, oh, I, I haven't tried um, in the last year or so, uh, but I, I will, I'll revisit it. But I was frustrated and I thought, well, now my novel is stopped because I don't know how to, how to proceed. And um, I had all this family history, but I didn't have quite enough. And I really got the genealogy bug. And so I thought, you know, I'm gonna go back to my mother's family, the Abbeys, because I know a lot about them and maybe I could add some updates to these two books. Relatives, they were both published in 1916. Um, Cleveland Abbey was a descendant and a very interesting person. Um, and he had this book commissioned and, and wrote, written. And this is a book that has um, all those lists of begats. You know, John Abbey married so-and-so and here are his children. Then it has, here are his, here are all his children and all their children. And so it just, it's all these lists of, you know, family members, but without very many stories or bits of information. And it goes on for 511 pages. And I thought, I, I don't, I appreciate it. I'm glad to have it but I don't wanna know about all those people. I wanna know about my ancestors and I want stories. Um, through Ancestry, I, um, I knew that, that John Abbey had come from England and settled in 1635 in Wenham, Massachusetts. And on Ancestry, I found a woman who was also related and she had studied all these parish registers and she had much better eyesight than I do and, and de determined um, that, you know, John, who John Abbey's parents were and who his grandparents were and had all these church records. And so it was, I can now prove that they were part of this uh, area of England, Staverton, Northamptonshire in 1475. Um, 
this other book, Memorial Captain Thomas Abbey, um, I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. Um, he's our Revolutionary War hero and um, Cleveland Abbey and his mother um, had a statue and some other things commissioned and there was a big ceremony in Enfield, Connecticut. Um, let's see. Okay, uh, about the same time when I'm, I'm looking at this and thinking that, uh, you know, I wanna just write my ancestors, I joined the Albuquerque Genealogy Society. And I know Brenda's a, a member and um, Hazel who's here, or some other people are as well. And the Albuquerque Genealogy Society um, focuses on ancestry from all over the world. Uh, we have on that last Thursday of the month, we have research days and we have people that will help you with Celtic, with German, Scandinavian, with uh, Daughters of the American Revolution and Mayflower, with Huguenots, we have African-American um, studies. We have people that work with military history. So it's, it's a very um, encompassing uh, focus for the Albuquerque Genealogy Society. If your family is primarily Hispanic from Mexico, South America, Spain, the New Mexico Genealogy Society is the one that, that focuses on, on that heritage. And, um, and they both use the same facilities at the library. Um, I also wanted to know, uh, in, in this genealogy, not just that Thomas Abbey married Sarah Fairfield, daughter of Walter. I wanted to know a little something more about Sarah and about her family. Well, that she, she was the first of, of the allied families, which is, are the wives of these men. And she, um, she was a daughter of Walter, son of John Fairfield. And so I found this website uh, hosted by a woman named Connie Fairfield Gantz, who had written a book, which out of print, but I found it when I went up to the East Coast and uh, did a lot of research. And she, uh, she was so helpful. She was so willing to share all these records and all this information and just really round out who Sarah was and who her father, Walter, was. Well, her father was a scoundrel. He, um, there are more than 47 court cases when Walter Fairfield was taken, uh, charged and taken to court. He verbally abusive, he beat people up. He didn't make his servant go to church. Uh, more verbal abuse. Um, his daughter was pregnant out of wedlock, so she was charged with fornication, and he was supposed to take her to court, and he refused to take her to court. Um, it, it just kind of goes on and on and on, and not only is it kind of fun to, to see could he outdo himself with the next charge, but also it gave a real picture of the community life because every all the neighbors were involved. You know, they would testify against each other in one case and then side with each other on another. And the abbeys were in there. I mean, it's just a lot of fun. So scoundrels can be can be um, a treasure trove in your in your family. Um, in fact, sometimes some people get a little boring and it's like, ooh, I wish I could find another Walter in here. He'd make a great character um, for a novel even. So, um, so there's that. Then um, here is the cover of, of my volume one. So Abby, Abby and allied families, the women who married them. And it goes from beginnings in England to the American Revolution. And here I am with my Revolutionary War hero, 
Captain Thomas Abbey of Enfield, Connecticut. He's a contemporary of Paul Revere and um, there's a drum and he they drummed people in and out of meeting, which was not really church. It was more like Thursday meeting and announced to them that um, the British were coming, the war had begun, and then he marched troops from Enfield to, um, to the Boston area. That, so I, that is my first volume. I had intended and written that I would include their son, Peter Abbey, who married a woman named Hannah Alden. And her ancestry goes all the way back to the Mayflower. Well, six generations of Aldens and all the families who married into the Aldens took up as many pages for that one chapter as the entire first book. And so <laughs> Rose very wisely helped me <laughs> decide that I should divide it into, into two volumes. So, the second one is being uh, formatted and hopefully we will get it published this fall. And that will concentrate on Peter Abbey and Hannah Alden and all the, the Alden ancestors. Um, the third volume is gonna talk about uh, Peter's son, Seth, who was one of the founders of Cleveland, Ohio when it was part of the Great Western Reserve of Connecticut. And then it will go down to my grandfather, Harry, AKA Henry Abbey Jr. The one of the, of the letters, the, the childhood letters that I showed in the beginning. This is, um, this is he when he was a Lieutenant. He was based at Fort Huachuca, Arizona. And, um, in my guest room, I have hanging his cavalry sword. He and his um, troops of the 10th Cavalry um, rode the Arizona-Mexico uh, border and quite often chased Pancho Villa and his troops back into Mexico. So there's, there's interesting history there. His wife, my grandmother, my mother's mother, um, her family came, uh, were Donovans, and they came from Ireland to Pennsylvania to Maryland. And through them, I have met um, this lady on the left. Her name is Jenny Art with her husband, Gunter. And she, um, she is a cousin on my mother's side of the family. And we have only met each other over the last, say, five or six years. And it's one of those where we said, I feel like I've known you my whole life. And um, a really uh, special collection, connection. And our last visit, she gave me this tiny tea set that has a circle drawn around it. It fits in the palm of your hand and it belonged to our great, great grandmother. Mary Elizabeth Berry. So that's, that's pretty fun. And lastly, volume four is going to circle back around to the Ashmans, the pioneers of California. And by then I will have, I will know much more about their ancestry and hopefully we will have broken that brick wall and get, um, get new information and be able to round out that story. I did, I have since then found out a little bit more about my uh, Lucinda Holland from Ireland. And Richard and I in 2018 traveled back to Ireland and this gentleman on the left, um, Robin McCreary and his daughter, uh, Helen are related through my grandmother's mother's family. And so he was able to drive us around and show us where their farm was located. He could read, he knew all the headstones in the cemetery that, that have aged so much that it's impossible to read. 
And we just had a delightful day um, meeting with them. And he gave Richard a black thorn walking stick as a gift. It was a little too large to put in our luggage. So we had to carry it on the airplane. And I guess because it was wood, it went through security. My sewing scissors that were an eighth of an inch too long got confiscated. But here we are walking on the plane with this, with this stick and people were like, like uh, <laughs> is that safe? So anyway, we, we, we brought that back with us, which is another fun, fun story. So I hope you're not uh, rolling your eyes and thinking, oh my gosh, is this woman ever going to stop talking? But I do want to talk about how, um, how um, I structured my story and um, some of the things that the lessons that I have learned by researching these ancestors. I've had a great time getting getting to know them, getting aha moments when I have uh, made connections. And, and some of them, there was a gentleman who um, was not a Puritan and he pushed back hard against um, the rigidity of the Puritans. And, and I thought about the, the days when um, I, I became um, ordained in, as a, as a, minister and the days that I had to push back against people in in the 1980s who said oh we don't think women should be ministers what are we going to do with you and um just lessons that I that I've learned um to to think about ancestors you know getting on a ship at 16 and coming halfway across the world and, um, you know, I had no qualms about, I mean, no, it's much more modern day, but about going to Ireland by myself and renting a car and, and driving all over. And so somehow the, the qualities and the characteristics that, that these ancestors have had, hopefully not too many on the scoundrel side, um, have, I've, I find those connections. They have shaped um, they've shaped who I am. And um, there is a study called of epigenetics, which talk about that, uh, and very simply, the, the, the oops, I don't quite want to go to them yet, um, that the traumas and the hardships and the griefs and the major life events and our responses to them become, they impact our, our DNA and are actually passed down along with the shape of our nose or the color of our eyes. And um, so I, 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 I look at these ancestors' lives and I think, yeah, I, I have not, I have inherited some of that. And I am today uh, in part because of who they were and in, has informed who I am. So I had, I've had a, a number of other aha moments. Sarah Fairfield's mother actually married this character, Walter, and her ancestry goes back to the Plantagenet Kings. And I had gone to a class, a AGS lecture about finding your royal ancestry. And I thought, yeah, you know, well, when I found that out, I was like, oh, and Richard comes running upstairs. Are you okay? I said, oh, yes, you can refer to me now as Princess Margaret. And, you know, of course, he just turned around, and went back downstairs. Um, other stories seem like maybe they're kind of boring. Um, and who wants to read and try to decipher these old wills? Well, this one is actually pretty readable. There are some of them that are like, oh, my gosh. And people that are paid to transcribe them uh, earn their money. But um, what you find with these is, is how they lived and the property they owned and who was important in their lives. And so there, there are those. 
and, and when you find transcriptions, they're gold. Um, so I also, as, as Rose was telling, I also wanted to include um, some of the social history. What was going on at that time? Uh, you know, I, I know that, uh, you know, we, we could write about the, um, oh, what am I calling? The Civil, uh, the Revolutionary War. Well, I'm not gonna do that. There are books and books and books. So I did write a few things about King Philip's War. And we knew about, um, say, Franklin's experiments with electricity. But here we find out that in 1633, the first bananas made their way to England. And I put some of these silly trivial things in here because I've dedicated these books to my grandchildren. And I'm hoping that they will find some of these little trivial things um, fun, fun to read and keep their attention. So here's King Philip. Paul Revere actually did that engraving and um, they, there's a long, long story, but um, they had a great number of wars in the early, late 1600s between the native peoples and the um, colonists that keep, kept needing more and more land. I also wanted to include in each section uh, something about the lives and role of women. And, um, but from the perspective of what it was like for them then, not from the perspective of 21st century woman looking at them. So I, I wanted to be sure that it was true as, as best I could to actually how they lived. And, um, I have four granddaughters. I was, you know, a, a clergywoman. There were a lot of, of thing. I have a daughter who's a daughter-in-law who's a cardiothoracic surgeon. And that revolutionary war hero, uh, Thomas Abbey, his wife, her father was the, the town doctor. And when he died, she became the town doctor in the late 1700s. And so my daughter-in-law, previewed some of that information and said, this is really interesting and kind of scary. So um, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to put those things. One of my other aha moments, I, I Googled Mary Pease, who's my sixth great grandmother. And this chest of drawers came up. It is a chest made for her by her father um, in 1714 when she married a Thomas Abbey, and it is in the America's collection on the lower level of the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. So that was kind of fun. All right, uh, let's see, I had a lot more and you might also, you know, what do you do with um, historical facts, maps, photos, origins of surnames, I did travel logs, I wanted quotes about family history in each chapter. And so I had pages that, you know, visiting this area with pictures. I did, there's a church um, and I put, you know, that picture with a little box about the church. And in that same village, they have a fall festival and they do scarecrows and there's a scarecrow of Queen Elizabeth complete with corgis you know, trivia, a, a little more trivia, something to, to, um, to make you smile. All right, so here I am. Did I, did I do all this myself? No, I've shared with you that I um, belong to the Ameri uh, Albuquerque Genealogy Society. I be belong and I have a tree on ancestry.com. If you have colonial American ancestors, American Ancestors, which is the website for the New England Historic Genealogy Society is, is an absolute must uh, for resources. I don't know if this is available at the library or not. I know Ancestry is. Um, and here's the Amer uh, Albuquerque Genealogy Society site. 
Um, we also have speakers once a month. And as I said, the research day on the last Thursday, and um, there's virtual help um, on the third Saturday, as well as um, a lot of special interest groups on military history and DNA and, and those sorts of those sorts of things. Um, so some of my fellow um, AGS members, we, we had a group for two years called the Writing and Publishing Group. And six of us have published eight family histories to date. Um, the group disbanded, but again, I hope that if there's interest in the class and more interest in AGS, we'll have a table on that last two, last Tuesday research day and, and help people that stop by to, um, to work on their family histories. Years and years ago, I, um, I read this quote um, that said, and, and it's a little bit updated, plant a tree, have a child, write a book. Uh, we can each plant a tree and there are places that you can donate money and they will plant the tree in, in the memory of a, of a pet or a, a loved one. And so that's something we can do to, to leave a legacy. Not all of us have children, but we can um, perhaps mentor an, a, a niece, a nephew, a student or another young person. And for all of us here in attendance tonight, I believe we can write. We can write essays and put them into a book. We can write blogs and put them into a book. We can start, we can write a genealogy and put it into a book. We could take one of our ancestors and do some character studies and put them into a book. And, and leave um, a legacy um, for the future. One of the other things, and this came to me as I was um, going through these slides, on the base of Thomas Abbey's statue, there is a poem, The Captain's Drum. It was written by Benjamin Franklin Taylor and it is engraved on the four sides of the base of his statue. So if you're a poet, you too can perhaps write poetry about your ancestors and compile those. Um, I think that's, I think I'm almost over time. And so I am going to stop talking and see if there are questions that I might be able to answer.